First of all, I'd like to thank you at a rather belated date for your thoughts on this and gifts and, and cards at the time of my birthday. I appreciate the kindness of all of you. Now, this is a very interesting and unusual occasion. And actually, very little is known about the deeper aspects of the Easter ceremonies. They have been closely associated with the Testaments and have been left as merely sacred times relating to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But there is a much older and a much more interesting and involved principle involved. And this is something that I think is seldom if ever mentioned. Actually, as you realize, in the Bible, we are told that after the crucifixion, Jesus descended into the underworld and to release souls in limbo and also to the harrowing of hell. Now, this thinking uh, has a very wide and deep original distribution among the religious beliefs of the world. Actually, if we go back to the uh, Alexandrian and pre-Alexandrian mystics, we find an interesting thought that has descended from a very old time, namely the problem of birth. According to our general consideration, the, the nine months of the prenatal epic constitute what the ancients called a broken wheel. We find the story of the broken wheel in the Bible, and we also know that it was the peculiar symbol of the martyrdom of Hypatia, or St. Catherine of Alexandria. The broken wheel with three spokes missing. Now this broken wheel was the symbol of the prenatal epic, in which nine months of preparation uh, resulted in the approximate appearance of the child in this world. But the ancients said that the cycle represented the nine steps of preparatory esoteric growth and the three broken spokes were the three initiations into the mysteries. Therefore, the human being is born into this world in nine months and born into the next birth in the three months or degrees of initiation. This was a very ancient belief and it has perhaps some very curious and remarkable implications. A number of the ancient pagan mysteries divided the rites and rituals into nine degrees or steps. And these constituted the degrees of preparation. And, and in the actual living life of the individual, the lesser mysteries or the nine degrees represented the uh, probationship or the preparation of the human being for greater enlightenment. So these nine steps, or the nine months of the prenatal epoch, actually relate to our lives here in this world, where by nine steps we cross the interval between birth and enlightenment. Thus the entire physical life of the individual becomes a symbol of the celebration of the lesser mysteries. Those of preparation, of probationship, and of the gradual mastery of the imperfections which prevent the advancement of consciousness. In other words, the nine months of the prenatal epoch represent the periods of purification in this life. The individual is given here uh, a prenatal existence a prenatal existence in the terms that he is alive in this world, but he is limited within a kind of womb of matter. He is held a prisoner of the physical body in which he lives and the physical environment in which he functions. So actually, physical life as we know it was regarded by these ancient peoples 
as a cycle of preparation for something else. This wife in itself is not the end. The fulfillment of the life purpose is not measured in the interval between the cradle and the grave. The individual is not complete merely because he lives through this world, but he is prepared for something better if he understands how to live in this world and also maintains the integrities which are the tests or initiations of the lesser rites. We are here, therefore, primarily to prepare for something better. There is something beyond, something more noble, something more universally significant than this little struggle to survive in this world. But without this struggle and this survival, we are not ready for anything else. We would mostly like to get over the trials and troubles of life, leave them behind, and go on to bliss. But this is not the way nature operates. Nature tells us that within our own structure, there is a chemical, alchemical procedure constantly going on in which we are growing toward our own true birth which has been referred to as the second birth. This true birth is the individual who has prepared himself to be born into the world of the wise. This is the, ex the interval of preparation, and we have been given all the instructions necessary to struggle with the tests, the problems, the examinations that are necessary to prepare us for something superior to our present state. The materialist is left on a difficult position because he has nothing to look forward to. A number of theologies which have lost their esoteric meanings also are a little difficult because, according to them, the individual here, if he lives a certain level, goes on to an unknown joy, while if he doesn't succeed, he goes to an eternal damnation. This is not very encouraging to most people. As uh, one man said rather wisely, most of us are too poor of spirit to go to heaven, but a little too good to go to hell. Therefore, we are tied into the wheel of rebirth. Reincarnation and karma become the instruments of probationship for a bigger and more important existence. Thus we find in the ancient rites and stories that we are here to solve problems, to transmute the various elements of nature, of our human natures, until we are prepared to take on the heavier responsibilities of mature existence. This world is the childhood of life for us. And after we finish the childhood, in the nine months of the symbolic epic, we then prepare for maturity in the three degrees of the greater rites. These the greater rites are the ones by means of which we release the divine potential within ourselves. Now the Christian mysteries have a certain very valid point which we also generally overlook. As Paul said, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Therefore, not only in this world must this Christ in you labor for fulfillment and release, but there has to be some relationship between the internal Christ in you and the afterlife. In other words, we take this Christ in us with us when we go, because finally it's important to us, lies in the fact that it is part of our own spiritual integrity. It is the very soul of us that goes with us out of this world into that which lies beyond. If we take this soul with us in a state of decrepitude, if the individual has had a poor life, unreasonable, not necessarily poor in the sense of simplicity, but poor in the sense of virtues, the individual takes into the, into the afterlife the very spiritual power with which he was created. It is still there and he has gone with it into another dimension of existence. But in this dimension of existence, the Christ in him must still abide. Therefore, in limbo, uh, the fact of the eternal value of the Savior 
is clearly indicated. In limbo are supposed to rest the souls of all who died in virtue prior to the advent of Christ. Therefore, they could not be converted to Christianity because the religion or the faith had not arisen. On the other hand, like Moses and Aaron and many of the patriarchs of the Old Testament, they were persons of virtue. They could not be disregarded. Also, the millions of human beings who lived nobly and kindly according to the beliefs they had could not perish simply because they had not gone through a Christian baptism. So limbo was for those who were not evil, could not be punished, should not be punished, but were not in part of the ordained and baptized Christian faith. This is one of the uh, points of, the, of Christ in limbo. In other words, he went to liberate or redeem or baptize by a spiritual mystery all of the virtuous who had lived before his advent so that they then became part of the orders of the blessed. This concept uh, was almost necessary but because of the combination of the Old and New Testaments. But it was still more a moral necessity because in the past there were very great and noble people. There were also noble people who uh, belonged to other races and other faiths because there were no faiths as we know them today involving Christianity prior to the Christian era. But all these noble people, the virtuous people who kept the rules, whether in China or India, Persia, Greece, Egypt or Rome, if they were virtuous as individuals, if they lived a good life, if they were honest in their dealings, and if they had a sense of the reality of a spiritual truth behind mortality, these souls were redeemed by the harrowing of Hades. It was a uh, mysterious factor or dimension in early Christianity. Now the uh, crucifixion of Christ, as was shown in the writings of Bami and many other Christian mystics, it was a heart mystery. And in the very early diagrams of the, of the early psychics of Christianity, there are many in which a human heart is depicted with the crucifixion occurring within it. There are also diagrams of the human heart uh, with the uh, entire concept of the Trinity, of the per three persons of the Godhead, within the human heart. So that in uh, mysticism, as far as it is understood, the heart mystery tells us all that the great cycle of Christianity is an internal experience. It is a mystery within us. It is something that is occurring constantly within the mystery of the soul itself. And this soul that we take with us when we go carries within it the divinity with which we are originally endowed. Therefore, when we leave this world uh, at the end of our physical existence, we take with us within ourselves the instrument of our redemption. In other words, the Christ in you remains that even after death and goes with us into the other world. Under those conditions, it is said that it descends into the realms of the dead. The realms of the dead being those who have left the body but still have the soul. And all of the great mysteries of life go with us when we go. They do not l stay here. Those things which belong to Caesar remain here. But those things which belong to God go with us when we go. And no individual goes empty-handed, no individual goes without hope or without any of the endowments of possibility with which we associate religion. So we have now a certain understanding of the death of Christ in this sense, that the Christ in us is crucified. The Christ in us descends into the realms of the dead. The Christ in us is resurrected through the restoration of our own consciousness. Now, in the uh, problem of this kind, we have to consider 
what uh, most uh, pre-Christian religions accepted and many of the post-Christian have, have also accepted and that is the doctrine of reincarnation. Reincarnation means that we go into the invisible world not to perish, not to go to eternal solution or punishment, not to be uh, weighed in the, ju in the balance and found wanting, but rather as part of a larger a cycle of existence. And in the post-mortal state, we carry with us all of our spiritual allotment, all of the essential nature of our in own internal integrities. The uh, uh, interesting figure, I think, of this appears in Buddhism, where we have Jizo, uh, the uh, benevolent teacher. Jizo, the bodhisattva of the little children. The name is almost similar to our own idea of Jesus. How the idea originated, we are not sure. It probably came from India. But we know that uh, in the worlds of shadows, uh, where the darkness causes the little souls to be lonesome and to wonder what happens next, these little infants in the world of darkness re represent simply human souls after death. While they're there, not knowing what to do, bewildered and lonely, they hear the tinkling of the alarm staff of the guardian of little children. And Jesus appears among them as a parent, takes them in his arms, he holds them close, tenderly nurses their needs, and wherever he puts a footstep, according to the ancient belief, a lotus blossom rises in the afterlife. This is, of course, a very sentimental type of thing. But perhaps it is a little more true than we realize. Because when we depart from here, we take also our hopes, our fears, our anxieties, and the seeds of our faith. Now, the, the seeds of faith probably are a little stronger after death than they are in this world. Because the first thing that happens when the individual passes out of this life is the actual experience of survival. He has always hoped it would be a good thing. He always hoped that some part of him would go on and live. He always hoped that there was some reward for his efforts, some opportunities for further growth, and certainly that he would abide in the love of God. This hopefulness which we have here is suddenly formed into a reality. The individual awaking from death finds that he is still alive. And this fact in itself proves immortality. It proves something that the physical world cannot bestow in its fullness. It proves that the materialist is wrong. Because among those who wake up after death will be the materialist himself. He may be a little drowsy for a while because he hardly believes the uh, materialist may feel that he is suffering from a delusion that he is surviving. But if he is suffering from the delusion, there must be a he who is suffering, and the fact remains that he has survived. So this survival is the beginning of a new experience, a new dimension of purpose. This survival also brings to, gradually to consciousness the idea of growth, the idea of going on, the recognition of mistakes, the realization that, man, that mistakes must be paid for, that there is a certain retribution necessary, but that this retribution is never a retribution of terror. It is never ugly. It is never cruel, because it is constantly guarded and guided by the indwelling divinity within ourselves. The Christ in us must express to us the need for our own repentance or our own reorganization of life but it is never a destructive thing the internal life of the individual cannot die but must go on guided by the indwelling divinity of salvation so this uh, particular uh, problem goes on a little further until by degrees the entity that is out of embodiment begins to realize that this experience is only part of a great educational theory. It is part of a growth process. 
it has all kinds of realities and truths in it that we do not generally understand. We find, therefore, that we awake from the sleep of mortality in the afterlife. But strangely enough, we awake from the white wakefulness of the afterlife by the sleep of rebirth. Gradually, we go through an inner experience, and then object objectively, that experience again fades away. But in each case, there is something residual there. The individual becomes more and more aware of his own continuity, becomes more and more aware of an infinite purpose that is worthy of our acceptance and our understanding. If we even for a moment experience the integrity of existence, if we know that the things that are happening are right, if we know that we're going somewhere and doing something that is meaningful, all of life here in this shadowed existence becomes more significant. It becomes obvious that the grave is not the end, and that the labors we performed here do not go down to dust with the body. So having this realization, we begin to reintegrate our lives here. We begin to prepare ourselves for the fulfillment of the nine months of the prenatal epoch, which are the periods of purification and regeneration. We find ourselves gradually rising from a primitive state through all the evils and through all the uncertainties of primitive existence. We also find ourselves, as we are today, in a world of competition, in a world of war, selfishness. We find in ourselves Im immense pressures which are not good. We realize that we haven't the integrities to live the principles we believe. We are led away into various byways in which... Uh, our moral conduct is not what it should be. It was for this reason that Plato took the ground. The punishment and uh, the after-death purgatory uh, recognized in some religions that this is actually a compensation here in this world. This world is the world and sphere of retributions. This world is where we suffer for our mistakes and keep on making them. This is the world in which the so-called damnation of the soul is achieved. Not that it cannot be, that it can be damned, it cannot be. But here is punishment, and punishment from, for ignorance, punishment for superstition, punishment for fear. Here we are faced constantly with problems, and until these problems are solved, we cannot cleanse the life. And until the life is cleansed, we cannot pass to a higher state of consciousness or a greater achievement. Uh, we uh, know, to, know that in almost all of the ancient religions, water was important. Water was purification. Water was the washing away of those pressures and forces which limit our uh, growth and spiritual unfoldment. So we can take a simple little example, as we find it every day, the person wandering along with a half-pleasant disposition, but also tensions, pressures, unpleasantness, conspiracies, uh, fears, remorses, all these emotions every day, so that truly we are creatures of little faith. We uh, accept all of the problems with the full force of emotional stress and a great many individuals become hopelessly neurotic before they get out of here at the end of a lifetime. They simply are unable uh, to experience uh, the right form of existence. For these persons, antiquity established the great institutions of religion. It gave also philosophy as a means of remedying the mistakes of life. But neither religion nor philosophy can be effective if the individual rejects them. If he refuses to accept the importance of correcting his own mistakes, he will keep right on making them. If he refuses to believe that he is rewarded for right by the solution of problems, if he don't, does not believe this, he does not benefit from it. Therefore, all of this is a probation ship, and this probation ship constitutes the nine months of the so-called prenatal epoch of the entity in this world. 
it's the nine months in the material sphere in which he is being prepared for the mystery of birth. And this preparation is under a constant guidance, a constant direction. There is a mysterious umbilical which connects the unborn human soul to God. And it is this which was called in the Bible the silver cord. Actually, we are guarded until the time for birth comes. But when that time comes, then we must stand on our own feet, take our own breath, and begin an independent and individual life. And at that moment, the whole responsibility of growth and progress depends, descends upon us. The individual is responsible for the life he lives. He is responsible for the use he makes of natural resources, not only in his own life, but in the world around him. He is responsible for the wars and crimes which he causes. He is responsible for his deviations from the proper conduct for which he was intended. He cannot say he does not know what virtue is, because he does. He has had ample opportunity, under the guidance and wisdom of the ancient ones, to prepare himself for a useful life. If he rejects this, denies it, or is in conflict with internal selfishness and pressure, then the problems go on unsolved. But in this case, there still is the same situation. The individual who passes out of this life with a great deal of unfinished business in his karma, in his relationship with the infinite pattern of things, still has the divine power within his own heart. Christ goes with him because it is the principle within himself, the Christ in him. And this is the key, the germ of salvation, which is called in the, in the Orient the Buddha seeds. The seed of inevitable perfection is in the heart of every living thing. The bodies may die, the heart may stop to beat, but the seed never ceases. It goes on, and it is like the parable of the mustard seed, which is the least among seeds, but grows into a vast tree. All these things are part of the old wisdom doctrines. Now in Egypt we have the story, for instance, of the nature of the afterlife, which is quite different from that that we have in the Christian faith. But it is worth thinking about because some way there has to be in our own hearts and minds something to take the place of purgatory and something that must be a remedy for in eternal damnation. These are not possibilities in the universe. Therefore, there has to be other explanations. Many ancient peoples were groping for these explanations, depending upon internal intuition and insight for a solution suitable to the need of the occasion. So in Egypt we have an interesting idea that after the death of Osiris, who died uh, assassinated by his own brother, the establishment of the great hall of, the, of judgment in Amenta, the great, he, the great wonderful temple where, Os, where the Osiris in the afterlife govern the quick and the dead. And Osiris therefore became, like Hades, a king of the underworld. But there was nothing about Osiris that was evil, nor was there anything about Hades that was evil. Hades was represented by the Greeks as a rather gloomy deity who did the best he could with a situation that got more complicated every day. And we might assume if Hades was somewhere around today, he would be glo more gloomy than ever because of the quality of, which, of what was descending into his domain. It would not be very attractive or inspiring. But anyway, Osiris ruled over a beautiful world, a world of uh, growth and happiness, an underworld that was really an over-life. Here he ruled with all of his court of deities, with Isis as his sister wife, and all of the good spirits and the great jury that was to judge the quick and the dead. And the one and only son of Osiris, the young Prince Horus, who was begotten of the father, begotten after the death of the father, therefore was the widow's son. This power 
was the custodian of mercy. Anything that Horus asked of his father would be granted because he was the only begotten and the beloved of the father. So when souls in sorrow and misery came into the great hall of judgment to pass the tests as to whether they could go on to a blissful existence, uh, the jury watched and decided, both read the tablets, Anubis brought in the soul of the deceased, and they stood in the presence of Osiris. And it was there that the deceased named his virtues, pointed out the good things he had done, and tried to prove that he was worthy to go in to eternal happiness. If it happened, as more often it would happen, that there were some doubts as to his worthiness, whether it was really true that he had never failed in charity, that he had never deceived anyone, that he had never profited at the loss of others, that he had never been cruel, that he had never neglected his children, that he had always thought of others first and not of himself. The great confession of faith has been said to be now to be so positive, so comprehensive, that not one person in a hundred million could actually honestly claim it. They were, it was a, the highest moral code for the dead that probably the world has ever known. But in this emergency, everything hung for, for a moment in suspension. The soul was not really worthy to go on. And the soul, speaking through the little urn in which the heart was hidden, said, Do not let me die with the body that lives and dies for only a day. And in this emergency, Horus comes forward. He is the one who asks his father to forgive the sin and to place the sin upon himself instead, that he would take the sin of the person and let the sin be neutralized so that the soul could go on to growth and peace. And unless there was great uh, emergency and some terrible matter involved, the father always permitted the son to redeem the soul so that the soul could go on into the better life. Now there's something about that that has a definite Christian uh, echo to it even though it was in uh, force in Egypt 2,000 years before the birth of Christ. And there is this intercession in which the soul intercedes for the salvation of the being. Then if it is worthy and it is allowed to go on, and in the psychostasia or the weighing of the soul, it is justified and protected by Horus. It is then led into the land beyond. And this land is not a strange wilderness, nor is it a place in which there is nothing but worldly palaces. It is, a, it is another Egypt. It is another earth, but a gentle earth in which the virtuous rest and carry on the, new, the common deeds of living. The Egyptians had no idea of, a, of an afterlife that was either punishment or laziness. They, the soul did not simply float around on flowery beds of ease. The soul in the afterlife kept right on doing the things that had made it happy and useful in the physical world. It kept on learning, in a sense. It kept on growing. And it kept on becoming more and more aware of its own divinity. And then came, finally, the exhaustion of this particular karmic cycle, and the soul returned to embodiment. But it brought back with it an internal security that it had not known before. It did not know the name of that security. It was not something that it could put its finger on as a reality. But the soul within became stronger. The determination to grow became deeper. And the ability to handle the common problems of life became greater. With each embodiment, the soul advanced a step in its growth by purification, by the mysteries of water, the mysteries of the cleansing power of the pure stream of the water of life the water of everlastingness, and those who drank thereof never thirsted again. So here we have a concept 
that was to influence the early rise of the Christian faith. It was a rising up of the belief that the soul itself uh, contained within it the eternal power of its salvation, that the spirit of the being was God, the soul of the being was Christ, and the body of the being was the ecclesia, or the assembly of the redeemed, the, the church, the building. The purified body was a church. The purified mind was a great university. The purified heart was the perfect religion. All of these uh, internal values were being gradually matured within us. And at a certain point, the power to consciously lead or direct this power, this power that light would help us to grow, would become individual. And we would have the right of self-determinism. The time would come when instead of growing under nature's laws, we would grow under self-dedication. And when the individual chose to be right, this was determinism, and immediately rewards, punishments, hesitations, and advancements began to arise within the character of the person. When he had the power to make the decision, he had the responsibility of the decisions that he made. This is pointed out rather clearly in some of the early writings of St. Thomas Aquinas, who was evidently aware of this particular concept in religion. So the person having passed through the various degrees, sustained by an inner life which he could not fully understand, gradually received the moral instruction which would bring him into discipleship or into an immediate association with the internal part of his own life. Well, while we are in our normal state of affairs, what are the great hindrances? Well, the great hindrance to our growth is ourselves. The great hindrance is our own ego, our own personality, and our own appetites and desires. It is the, really the materiality in ourselves which is the evil spirit. It is pride, it is ambition, it is avarice. All these are the emotions of the unredeemed, and these become the basis of a responsibility after we have become aware of the values and realities of these matters. The individual who, knowing that he uh, is drinking too much, continues to do so, becomes an alcoholic. He is an alcoholic by choice, not by necessity. He has chosen something in, in, of a weakness within himself. He has avoided the strength of character necessary to control and direct his life and gradually becomes a victim of his own weakness. Therefore, this is a condition in which a karmic situation is set up because he knew better and didn't do. If he didn't know better, then there was another type of life relating to him then there was another kind of dimension in which his growth would take place. But when he knew, or when he believed, and he did not do, then he was in trouble. Because he not only destroyed his own integrities, but went against the principle within himself. He is the one who became the traitor. The individual who, knowing, realizing, and understanding the power of good within himself, does not live according to it, is a betrayer of that good and is the source of the suffering and misery of the divine being within. This uh, the ancients held as a moral value, a reality. Of course, we put it into words. It's oversimplified. There's no question about that. But on the other hand, while it doesn't necessarily sound as though it solved everything, it helps to give us a new angle or a new point with which to consider that it. After we go a certain length of time and so forth, we discover that we need instruction. And instruction is an important thing. But where are we going to get it? Well, we, we know somebody who we think knows more than we do, so we go and become a student. We try to gain the skill of a violinist or the wisdom of a philologist, and we feel that we can go to some wise person here and be uh, instructed. 
In India, the, the individual desiring spiritual refreshment goes to a guru, becomes a disciple, and may stay with the teacher for the rest of his life. He stays with the teacher and is happy because as he watches the teacher, the teacher is doing what is right. The teacher is living what he claims, and this gives the confidence to the disciple to remain with him. Now, in this type of situation, we also have to find out what can we do about those things uh, which teachers apparently cannot communicate to us. They can tell us what we ought to think, but that doesn't make us think that way. We get very noble instructions, but we, uh, we're not really immediately changed by it. Something is weak in ourselves. And we also go to various sources for instruction and usually get a lot of conflicting reports. Uh, we go to ten different people and we get ten different stories. We join ten different faiths and follow ten different doctrines and still have not the courage to live the kind of life we ought to live. We also sometimes assume that we don't have to, that if we uh, uh, select the right religion, that the religion will cure us that the, as a, by joining we accomplish all. This is like the paint slogan, save the surface and you save everything. <laughs> but uh, actually it doesn't work that way. No matter how noble the institution may be, it cannot do much for us unless the individual begins to grow within himself rather than simply depending upon instruction bestowed upon him. Now, instruction is valuable up to a certain point, but then we have to realize that we must find our own core. We must discover the reality within ourselves. And this reality within ourselves is something that we have to finally uh, experience through dedication. And this means that the statement in the Bible, be still and know that I am God, is a virtual truth. It is a very important statement. And then we come face to face with a few words that we don't know what to do with. Be still. Now, how to be still without being lazy is a question. How to be still and stay awake is a question. Because in our consciousness of things, stillness is inertia. And inertia is wrong. We should be out rolling up our sleeves and doing great heroic deeds. But the scriptures tell us, and, and Lao Tzu told us, Buddha told us, and Confucius told us, Zoroaster told us, Moses told us, and Jesus told us, that the actual problem is the accomplishment of quietude, a complete silence, a strange quietness, a dying out of the fires by means of which life is distorted. The individual has to be able uh, to be receptive, not to the instruction outside of himself, but to the instruction that is descending from within the deepest part of himself. The great teaching comes through the individual, not to him, because the great teaching in every case must be according to the need of the student. The uh, teaching must be that which is next for the person and not a vast sectarian denomination. It must be that the teaching solves the daily living problems of growth. So the, how do we do that? Well, we have to smooth out some way the inconsistencies and fallacies by which most of us live. We must get rid of all of the intensities and tensions which lock us into a world of petty incidents and constant frustrations. The, we must get over neurosis, which is an escape that the individual can no longer live with his own ignorance. He gets sicker and sicker, and finally perhaps has to have professional assistance. But these things are all of the body, and somewhere back of that body, as is represented in the mystery of the heart doctrine, is the heart itself, within which seated eternally is the Holy Trinity. And that this is this internal power, which is in everything, every grain of sand, carries within it 
the secret locked power of its own ev evolvements, of its own divinity, which will ultimately grow into a perfect spiritual integrity. So that the actual answer to all our problems lies in giving the internal a chance, giving it the right to lead. And to, in order to be able to lead, we must purify or cleanse ourselves of a false doctrine, a false teacher within ourselves, which is largely ego, which is the individual who believes to do as he, please, as he pleases is his divine right. This is not true. To do what he should is his divine right. And if he fails in this, ultimately he will fail, and a world on false values will also fall apart. So to get this point of freedom from opinion, the individual has to learn to be still. He has to learn not to be swayed by opinion, his own or anyone else's. He has to be free from the intensities. He can no longer enjoy righteous indignation. He can no longer hate anything, because all these things are hindrances. They block his inner life. They set up vibrations which frustrate the release of his own internal divinity. The more mistakes he makes in his personal life, the more completely he locks out the divine life. And that power which is constantly seeking to lead is imprisoned within a world of false attitudes which have become familiar, acceptable, and are often defended to the bitter end. So the, to get over this, we can uh, consider, for instance, the Zen monk, the Zen school, a school of complete quietude in which there is not one moment of negation, but there is no agitation there is no pressure of false values moving in. The Zen monk is not going to suddenly decide to go into the banking business. He is not going to decide to go out and build a great temple. He is a quiet person who realizes that the greatest gift that he can make to life is to learn to obey its laws and live according to principles rather than policies. Now, the same thing happens in many other parts of the world. We find it always. And uh, we find that uh, uh, in the Christian faith, the monastic orders. Now, the monastic orders were, many of them, very sincere, but some of them also a little difficult, a little unreasonable. There are cases known in which monks lived in a monastery uh, for many years, without ever lifting their eyes above the floor. They lived and walked around with their eyes on the floor for the rest of their lives. Now this is certainly a dedication, but it is not one in which we do much for anybody, including our own inner life, because the inner life is not only a, a problem of regeneration, but it is a problem of usefulness. The uh, important transformation is the motion from self-interest to divine interest, from thinking only of our own projects and turning gradually to think of the projects of the universal purpose, which we must all sometime meet and face and obey. So the quietude comes in. The path of life smooths out. The parents and children have proper attitudes toward each other. There is no effort any longer to tyrannize, enslave, or dominate. There is no longer in desperate efforts to transform somebody's belief to match our own. There is no problem by which uh, wealth is considered to be indispensable to internal security. All of the false values have to cease. And that means discipline. And these, the ceasing of these false values is the principal occupation of the nine postnatal months of the individual, which are in terms of his material lifetime. He is born with these burdens, that he shall live through the material world 
and shall achieve the, uh, the unity of life, which is his proper destiny. If he does these things quietly and conscientiously, he will find that the whole world looks a little better to him. He will discover that he doesn't have to have enemies because there is no such a thing as a sincere animosity of this kind. There's a story of two Japanese businessmen, both a little bit on the materialistic side, having become uh, involved in the Nihon Ginkgo, a Jap great Japan bank. They were bankers, and they were rivals. But they met, and when they met, first of all, they bowed very deeply three times. Having done this, they then went to work on each other to gradually destroy or overwhelm each other in one way or another. But they explained afterwards very simply that the competition was a material policy, but that the three bows were to, to the divine within. So to prove that they could have a very unpleasant relationship with each other, but both respected God. Now, to respect God and hurt each other is one of the curiosities of modern existence. <laughs> to love God in ourselves and hate it in other people is a, a great mistake. But we make this mistake all the time. But if we bow to everyone, not because they're good or because we like them or because they've been kind to us, but because behind whatever attitudes they have is the same divinity, a divinity which is suffering very deeply from the conduct of the individual who is built up around it so that uh, we can always respect the God in things even if we have trouble getting along with the humanities. This is part of the old belief that this we must get to round to the point where in very great quietude we live our lives wasting not one ounce of energy on conflicts doing absolutely nothing that is a waste of life, time, or God. And the waste of life is a waste of God. This means not, however, that we are powerless or worthless, but that we are able to quietly accept and organize the occurrences that come into our lives. We do not quarrel with people. If they do not wish to see it our way, that is their right. We can recommend, we can offer, but we cannot demand. We do, may not like the man our daughter married, but it, she is the one that has to live with him. And we have no right to try to break up that marriage, simply because we do not like. All these things of interferences, all these efforts to dominate something, all these efforts to criticize, condemn, judge, and mostly misjudge the experiences of life, prevent the revelation of the truth. And in the, in the process of this, we have to realize that in that level of ourselves, in that stratum on which we exist, in that the we have buried the Christ in the Holy Sepulchre. Christ is buried in the shortcomings of the body around it. It is buried in the mortality which denies it. It is buried in the personality that has neglected its virtues. It is that in which the uh, redeeming power is denied the right to redeem. Now, we can't win that fight either. We cannot prevent redemption from redeeming, but we can make it a delay. We can waste much time, cause much suffering to each other, and frustrate the divine plan. As long as the human being has a divine power buried within it, his body and his personality constitute a holy sepulcher. And it is the resurrection of that which is symbolized by the Easter mystery. The Easter mystery is the resurrection of the eternal through the temporal. And it is something that cannot be done in a moment, and it cannot be done by wishfulness, nor can it be done actually by prayer. It must be done by works. It must be that we offer to the divine within us 
the, the deeds that we perform as worthy. Our words must be of integrities. Our lives must be of creative benevolence. Our thoughts must be constructive. Every part of ourselves must be looking toward the realities of things. And when there is nothing in our hearts or minds but the simple desire to give expression to the divine at the root of existence, and when nothing else that is more important than that, or even as important, then actually the inner life begins to move through. And when we release the Christ in us, which is our source of glory, into manifestation, then we are what the early mystics called Christians. Up to that time, we're not really Christians. We may be Christ-seekers. We may be looking for something. But we are never Christians until we have given release to the Christ in ourselves. We are never Christians until we can say in the terms of Christ, Thy will not mine be done. And we have to realize that in everything we do, every breath we draw, there is this invisible presence behind us, this presence that is behind everything that lives, every existence from the least to the greatest galaxy, that this power must be released by man through what we call humanity. And humanity is a humaneness. Humanity is brotherhood. It is kindness. It is cooperation. It is the individual willing to sacrifice for the good of others, a person of integrities who does not want a gain by the loss of others. Little by little, if this quality continues, the, the, the mind and nervous system relax. There are no longer jitters. We are able to control the words we say. We are not giving over to suspicions and doubts and jealousies and all the infirmities of the flesh. We are quiet, at peace with life, at peace with the God that runs and leads and moves all things. And in that moment, we become very close to the presence of wisdom. In that moment, the resurrection takes place. The regeneration, or as they call it in alchemy, the transformation or transmutation. When this personal self uh, abdicates within ourselves and the divine self becomes the ruler of conduct, most of the problems of the world will end because this is the beginning of a new life in glory, a life in which we live not for ourselves, but to re release and reveal the eternal through ourselves. In alchemy, this is called the transmutation of base metals. In spiritual alchemy, it is the transmutation of the uses of the energies which we possess. We have minds for to, to be used, but not abused. We have emotions to be expressed, but not depraved. We have bodies to serve us wisely and well, which we should not destroy by our own selfishness and indulgence. We have all kinds of gifts, but it is our duty to gather these gifts and bring them to the feet of the divine within ourselves. We offer ourselves to the service of the eternal. And in that moment, in that instant, the eternal is reborn. It is brought forth from out of the cave or out of the darkness. The body truly then becomes a holy sepulcher from which the divine power rises in triumph. It is this transformation, this resurrection of the good, which is really the essence of religion. It is the essence of everything that we're trying to be and trying to do and trying to have. And until we realize this, we are more or less in trouble. So at Easter, it is very practical to give some thoughts to these things, to realize that this is a day in particular in which Christendom would wish and hope that the Christ in them has a chance to be heard from, that it has a chance for in a moment of prayer, a moment of quietude, a moment of rest, to suddenly beware, become aware <clears throat> of the tremendousness of the eternal fact of eternal life. 
the trans that uh, transformation is forever bringing about a, a growth of things that we are all moving along a path that leads ultimately to identity with the divine plan we are all children of a larger nation the commonwealth of heaven earth and man we are all part of an enormous plan and as we look out into the space beyond us and send spaceships out to take photographs of Uranus or Neptune or Pluto, we think of the incredible distances involved. But when we look inside ourselves, those outside distances look as nothing. The tremendous distanceness within us is inconceivable. Within us are distances that to take hundreds of lives for even to think that we can cross them. But as we go further and further in this type of journey, we come nearer and nearer to reality. Whereas in the conquest of the outside, it goes on forever. We never come to the end of the illusion. We never come to the end of space. Because that is not the way that growth can be accomplished. Space is nearly a name, a physical name, for an eternal life. If we look for the solution physically, we will never find it. But if we realize that this space is the infinite opportunity of divine presence within all of us, that there are spaces within us that deeper than ever did plummet sound, that there is a tremendous universe, a cosmos, locked within each human being, one that has to be solved, has to be discovered and experienced. Uh, now we are in a rather difficult and sticky situation in this world. We find that the materiality of man is closing in on him, is coming in every direction. He has forgotten that the very life by means of which he makes his mistakes, that that very life is the key to his own survival. He has to stop the misuse of these things and come finally to the proper realization of his place in a great plan, a great purpose, a great need that is going on. Within each individual is the key to the solution of himself. And when each individual finds the solution to himself, the world is in order. Because the world's dilemma is arising from those who do not know anything about themselves and care nothing about anyone else. This situation is the source of tyranny. We think we are going to get over poverty by laws and legislations. We think we're going to get over dishonesty by putting everybody in jail. Well, these are things that come up. Some way they probably have to be faced. But dishonesty will never end simply by jailing the criminal. The only end to any vice is the power of the internal virtue to survive and to surmount it. If we are able to grow, we outgrow our own vices. If we are able to unfold the potentials that we have, we can become useful citizens in the great commonwealth of existence. Everything has to outgrow its own infirmities. And for this there is no physician. The infirmity can be cleared only by the divine power, which is the healer of all woes. So that in this Easter time, we think now of the, the resurrection of the Lord of love. Now, we would like to have peace marches. We would like to have all these things. And they all do bear witness to a deep internal realization of a great need. But the resurrection of Christ is the resurrection of love in our own hearts. It is the restoration of the solicitude that we have. It is the, po the power of ourselves to become again the good shepherds and the faithful sheep. It is the strength to follow along the path that leads to enlightenment. The Bible says that the path is very narrow and that very few find it, but it is the one and only road. And when we find it and go along it, we have something that we never know until we do this. And that is peace of heart, peace of mind. 
we can learn to love each other in a constructive, genuine way. The, these false stimulations of dissipation end in destruction, but the true spread of internal life, the entheus, our word enthusiasm from entheus in God, the great joy of life comes from the divine enthusiasm. The individual who suddenly finds that happiness is a very simple and immediate thing and that it is simply the result of living a kindly life, a, a gentle life. And that when we do this, we have finished the probation ship. When we have no enemy left, when we have no doubt about the reality of things, when we have no intention of advancing our own happiness or success at the cost of anything else and have accepted fully our responsibility to share in the forming of a better world. When we do these things and feel this way, then we stand at the gate of the great mysteries, the three days of the resurrection from the grave. These are the rites by means of which we release into manifestation the power of the divine trinity within ourselves. We know from the biblical account that the three days is not quite literal because it wasn't exactly that long. But it becomes symbolical of the three steps that, of the greater rites of redemption. The mysteries of the Holy Spirit, the mysteries of the Messiah, and the mysteries of the eternal God. These are steps by, of experience by means of which we become rededicated to the causes of all things. We become what we might term initiates. They are, we are then the servants of realities. We turn gradually from all other occupations to the services of these three great powers. The power of the dissemination or the Sangha, which is the Holy Spirit, the power of the Messiah, which is the teacher, and the power of the eternal, the divine, which is the source of all life. And strangely enough, when we do this, we, are not, we don't find it just exactly what we thought it was going to be. It's not a rather dull, monotonous morality or anything of this kind. Because everything that is wonderful in the world is some way mixed up into this. Suddenly everything becomes meaningful. We begin to understand a child for the first time in our existence. We begin to really know the meaning of a sunset. We become conscious of the rights of creatures. We see the beauty of nature. We see the wonders of space. And we also see the constant and endless need for understanding of the needs of simple creatures. All these things become so important to us the painter can still paint it, just as he did before, but he has a different consciousness behind it. Those who are in various responsible positions of leadership can stay there. But then their services will be true, and they will be happy, content, justified, and proud of their contributions to the common good. The uh, improvement of the self does not prevent the individual from enjoying his existence. It makes for the own enjoyment that he can really accept as right in himself. It is the only enjoyment that does not leave him with a bad conscience. So in this time of resurrection, uh, it might be a good plan to sort of look over ourselves and see if there's something that needs a little resurrection there in our own conditions. Is there some relative we haven't spoken to for ten years that might be a good time to pick up the phone and do it? Maybe they'll hang up on us, but that's their business. <laughs> Our business was to phone. We may find that we have a, a grudge against something. We may find that we gossip too much, uh, that we are too sorry for ourselves, uh, that we are envious of the possessions of others, and that we are constantly degrading or downgrading those around us, possibly in the hollow hope of appearing more superior ourselves. The going through all of these things, see if we cannot transform them into a positive recognition that everything in life is an opportunity to do it as Christ would have had it done. 
that is the Sermon on the Mount is important that if we have an enemy forgive him and not depend upon the law to punish him but be to realize that the meek will inherit the earth because they will not destroy anything and that it is the pure of heart who will see God these things are part of the Easter mystery it is an awakening at the vernal equinox as the sun moves northward it is the beginning of a new day in which we may all see the light more clearly than before but in order to see the light we must believe in the light we must realize its importance and we must realize that whatever that light tells us to do that we must do regardless of whether it's what we wanted to do or not the final glory of it is to discover that what that light wants done is the thing we have always wanted to see done but did not know how to do it so in this season here we have a new time of transmutation and transformation this is not the beginning of a zodiacal year this is the beginning of a psychological year we have now ahead of us another span of time that is given to us to serve and to work we are facing it with the beginnings of the same problems that the ancients had one way or another even in this material system we have to get rid of the taxes first but at the same time this is a year of new beginnings in which everything we do should be done just a little better than we did it before that we should be just a little more patient a little more kind we probably can't be completely reformed in one special moment unless a tremendous internal experience is revealed to us but we can gradually grow a little and the great experiences the visionary experiences the great illuminations are always the re reward for humble effort honestly accomplished that in simple and gentle ways we do what is good and all of a sudden the good comes to us in a blaze of inner consciousness of realization and man is never really proud of himself until he has done those things which were his proper destiny so at least do we have a chance to kind of think about these things we have the possibility of the fact that the Christ in us having passed into limbo that is having gone down into our level of internal life is rising on this day from the sepulcher of our past attitudes and convictions and is knocking again at the door asking to be accepted into our house to be the unseen guest at our dinner the unseen priest at our sacraments that this presence coming forth at this time is the symbol of the annual resurrection physically represented by the rising of the Son of Truth this is when the Sun moves northward and it is also the symbol that the ancients used to them the Sun was the symbol of ultimate benevolence it shines upon the just and the unjust it serves all things great and small it is the source of every good thing we have it makes for possible all the growths of life it provides us with our food it makes possible for us to see the joy and glories of nature and we also use it for the accomplishment of everything we have for it is this divine light behind our eyes that helps us to read a good book everything that is important and if we can take value of this at this particular season of the year it will probably help us to solve some very nagging problems people come to me every day with their troubles and nine-tenths of these troubles are simply the fact that the person isn't quite able uh, to make use of his own divine potential he doesn't realize that when he does it well the worlds rejoice and when he does it badly the Christ in him weeps all these things are part of our labor for it is not only the power of the Christ principle to save us it is our daily job to save that principle to make sure that it does not die in us another time on the poor story of Covatus Domini 
the uh, author uh, tells that as Peter was leaving Rome uh, to escape persecution, he sees Christ approaching him on the wet, on the Appian Way, and Peter says, "Quo vadis, Domini? Whither goest thou?" And the Christ says, "I go back to Rome to die a second time." And this is the problem we have, where everything go badly, where we betray the good, the good in us dies again. Not really, because it will rise, but it loses the, the beauty and joy of faithful de de dedication. To serve reality is a privilege and a joy. And we can always begin with just little things, little di deeds of thoughtfulness, little kindness. It's the solution of the immediate difficulties which nag us. Not great things, but little things we have made great by misunderstanding. We can take these little things that we have made great by misunderstanding and outgrow them and remove them and have new virtues as a result of our integrities. It's just a simple problem of doing it a little better. The better we do it, the nearer we come to that time when it will be done right. And the more that we work in this direction, the sooner it will be that the spirit of universal love can become the common ruler of all that lives. The final monarchy of all things is the rulership of love over humanity. And it can only happen there when it happens with us in daily living. Thank you very much. <laughs>